And you, you know, and and as you said, people they should first of all ignore national polls. I mean, they're they're good for mm -hmm. directional. You know, is Smith gaining or Jones lo losing? Hear the full conversation on the latest edition of the Balance of Power podcast. Listen on the Bloomberg Business app, Bloomberg.com, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. It's 440 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. Turned out to be a mixed Wednesday for the U.S. equity market with the Dow Jones Industrial Average lower. S&P, NASDAQ, they're both higher. The bond market rebounded from session lows with Jay Powell only reiterating the Fed's wait and see approach before policymakers decide to embark on interest rate cuts. S&P today up five, a gain of one tenth of one percent. Dow Industrials down 41, a decline of one tenth of one percent. The NASDAQ composite Positive index up 37, up today by two tenths of one percent. Ten year 4.34 percent. The two year 4.67 percent. Spot gold up 19 dollars the ounce, up eight tenths of one percent. 2,299 on spot gold. West Texas intermediate crude up six tenths of one percent. 85.62 for a barrel of WTI. Well, as for the overall market backdrop, Catherine Rooney Vera is chief market strategist at Stonex Financial. We could go one of two ways. We could see a reacceleration in the economy, which means reflation and a Fed that cannot cut, or God forbid, even has to cut hike. Um, or we could see um, uh, the rising risk of uh, a Fed-induced recession with too high nominal rates and inflation um, continuing to fall, meaning that real rates uh, really start to bite the U.S. consumer. Ulta Beauty shares plunged after the company said it expects first quarter comparable sales to come in at the lower end of the low single-digit growth range it had forecast for the first half of its fiscal year. Ulta today down by 15.3 percent. Again, recapping stocks mix the Dow lower by 43 points, down one tenth of one percent. S&P up one tenth of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thanks so much for that update, Charlie Pellet. Well, former President Trump's cash crunch in the face of mounting legal costs is revealing who's willing to come to his aid as he seeks another term in the White House. Carol, while some on Wall Street may donate to his campaign. Commingling financial interests is seen as another matter after he was found to have inflated the value of his assets by billions of dollars in bank transactions. This is why the story is so interesting. Max Abelson and Tom Maloney write about the small group of financiers who are the Trump lenders of last resort. Tom, by the way, of course, editor here at Bloomberg News, and he joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Um, great story, great read. Uh, who are these lenders of last resort for the former president? So the, the provider of this bond is a company called Knight Insurance, which is owned by Don Hankey, uh, otherwise known as the subprime auto king of Southern California. Uh, his company, Westlake. <laughs> Do you know him? I did not know. I did not know. <laughs> You're there from was such Southern a California. Thing. I am. <laughs> uh, his company, Westlake, is a real kind of pioneer in providing or innovating subprime auto loans um, a long time ago uh, after he inherited his father's car dealership. Um, so he, he's got this connection there with Knight Insurance, which provided this um, $175 million bond to Donald Trump. But he's also the biggest individual shareholder in another company called Axos Bank, which has refinanced a couple of Trump's properties in the last couple of years. How, how, are, you look, how are you viewing this loan? Because is it, is it one that is a business opportunity or is it one that is supportive of the candidate, former President Trump? Hmm. I think it's both of those things. You know, I mean, look, he has said, this is Don Hankey, has said that there's kind of a business opportunity here because there are these big banks that don't necessarily want the political risk, and he's comfortable with that. He's also said he is a Trump supporter, but that's kind of a by-the-by -by thing for him. It's not the reason why he's making these decisions, but, you know, obviously it's hard to tell. I mean, I would say when other parties don't want to do a certain type of business that, that there is an opportunity there. And uh, Don Hankey, you know, obviously he is a person that's comfortable lending to high risk credits. Uh, and maybe this is just another one for him. Well, it sounds like they have a little bit of a relationship, right? Or they have a little bit. Um, he has said that he's never spoken to Donald Trump before. Ah, so right? just business. Yes, that's correct. I mean, people in his family have donated to Trump before and uh, he has donated to Trump in the past. He said he's voted for Trump. But he said that this is, you know, this is a business decision and he doesn't have a personal relationship with Trump. Is he willing to talk? It sounds like he was. He was accessible. 
He spoke to a uh, legal reporter that we have yesterday. Yes. Okay. Um, do we know the terms of this of these uh, loans? Is so it this, like that subprime auto thing. <laughs> so the, the you know look, these appeal bonds is kind of a a very niche part of the finance market, and it's not one that, to be frank, I'm especially familiar with. But it's completely collateralized by cash. So wow. from that perspective, there's not a lot of risk, right? You have you have cash for this 175 million. So meaning so meaning that. The president, the former president, shows that he has one hundred seventy-five million dollars in cash. So, then a company gives him a loan for that amount. They issue the, they give the bond to the appeals court covering right. that one hundred seventy-five million. But huh. they, my understanding is, they get that one hundred seventy-five million in cash. So, there's really very little risk to them. Uh, I think what probably turned some people off is obviously there's a, a political risk. You, you know that. Chubb was the um, mm -hmm. the lender on yeah. Trump's mm -hmm. larger bond um, last month, and there was a lot of controversy around them doing that business. They had to come out and say, quote, "Sorry, smaller bond, not larger bond." We larger are the CEO 90, yeah. of uh, Chubb. Evan Greenberg had to come out and say, "quote We are in no way supporting the defendant." Exactly. So it was a little bit of a different reaction there from what we saw uh, from Don Hankey. But you do wonder about, um, you know just face value these individuals who do come to the aid of the former president and whether or not again just speculation on my part and f observers would probably say the same thing about whether they're just strategizing that whether or not Donald Trump gets reelected and that gives them potentially <laughs> a very nice relationship with what could be you know his second term in the White House you know absolutely I think that's something that needs to be looked at and you need to be aware of these relationships and it's tricky for Donald Trump. I mean, he was already a businessman with a lot of different debts and a lot of different business opportunities. He was constantly exploring and branding and hotels all around the world. And, and it wasn't always so transparent too, right? It wasn't always very clear, some of it. No, I mean, look, it's a, it's a, he's got a lot of different buildings and a lot of different businesses and it's, it's, it's certainly not transparent. And it's only gotten kind of less transparent as we get closer to the next election, I think. Okay, Don Hankey, the subprime auto loan king of Southern California, is one of the parties involved here. You and Max also profiled uh, Gregory Garibrands. Um, talk a little bit about who he is. Yeah, so he was a former Goldman Sachs um, investment banker. He's now the CEO at Axos Bank. This is the bank that uh, refinanced a couple of Trump properties that I mentioned and that um, Hankey is the biggest individual shareholder in. Um, he is well known because the bank it used to be called Bank of Internet. It's a sort of an unusual <laughs> online only name. financial institution and it's Is that like Bank of Chocolate? Um, bank of Interestingly know. it also bank kind of, of cell phones? was involved in some big Kushner um, real hmm. estate refinancings ah. a few years ago. So hmm. there's a certainly a relationship there between Axos and Trump and Trump related figures that's been going on for, you know, at least five years now. He's got an interesting backstory, though. Goldman Sachs, right? Well known, obviously. Uh, we talk about Goldman, uh, one of the well, well iconic Wall Street firms. But I forgot that his pay, I guess he got a lot of attention when his pay went above. Was it? Uh, Jamie Dave? Dimon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Running a bank that's a, a bank fraction of, internet. of the size. Bank and, of Internet is oh, yeah, yeah. the place to work. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. Like, who knew? Like, that is just crazy. Um, I don't know. Your takeaway when you do a story like this, right? And we all followed as uh, the former president was trying to come up with that bond payment, if you will, um, or post that bond and was really struggling uh, to find people. I don't know. What's your takeaway when you do a story like this and you see some of the individuals behind it? My takeaway when I do a story like this is uh, how many interesting individuals there are out there with all of these strange businesses like subprime auto lending and insurance and you know and you could still never have heard of these people. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah, no, I and wonder... they made they've done really really well, mm -hmm. right? These are and just remind us seven how and a half billion yeah. is worth. Yeah, that's how risky how risky are these loans? Uh well, the subprime? What are you talking about? No, the ones oh. that they're giving the former president. Not risky at all. No, not risky at all. I mean, I think there's a similarity it's really like, with the subprime business. You know, that's a kind of a, seems like you're lending to a really risky counterparty, but the collateral that you have is really good. And yeah. Repossession technology. He's got, a, he's got a car technology company as well, Don Hankey, which I think does a lot of repossession stuff for car dealerships. You know, on the face of it, it seems like it should be a, a risky loan, but it's actually not. 
I don't know. I'm just still, like, I got stuck at the mannequins thing. I'm not going to give it away. It's in the story. <laughs> but it's like, gosh. Hey, if you've driven past it growing up, maybe you know Did about you? it. Did no, you? No, not this one. You didn't get around. I thought you were this from this area. Central Coast, not mm-hmm. L.A. So. Anyway, unbelievable read. Um, Tom, thank you so much. Tom Maloney, he is editor at Bloomberg News. Check out this story. You can find it on the Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Catch complete coverage from the world of politics and the world of business on Bloomberg Balance of Power. Tune in for Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lyons tonight at 5 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Radio and Television. Now your three-day weather forecast on Bloomberg 1130. Occasional rain for tonight around the city. Breezy as well, low temperature, low 40s, and mostly cloudy skies on Thursday. Just some scattered showers left over in 45 to 50. Any showers quit tomorrow night. Low temperature back in the mid to upper 30s. Maybe a brief shower on Friday with clouds and some sun. Breezy in 50. Periods of cloud and sun breezy and in the 50s here for Saturday, the start of the weekend. This is Gary Best with your three-day forecast on Bloomberg 1130. Get the news you need to start your day in just 15 minutes. Now to the latest on the war in the Middle East. Optimism that the Fed will be able to engineer a soft landing. Wake up with Bloomberg Daybreak, U.S. edition. The Supreme Court is set to hear oral arguments tomorrow. A lot of upsets in college basketball. Available now on your podcast feed. Each weekday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern. The latest in the presidential race. Subscribe to Bloomberg Daybreak, U.S. edition today on Apple, Spotify, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Bloomberg Radio. Context changes everything. Every day, Cintas service reps help businesses get ready for the workday. They provide freshly laundered workwear delivered every week. Mats, mops, restroom and cleaning supplies, first aid and safety products to help your employees stay safe. They even test and inspect fire extinguishers and emergency lights. Cintas helps keep your business running smoothly. See what Cintas can do for you. Visit Cintas.com. Oh, I'm ready! And get ready for the workday. Why just listen to Bloomberg Surveillance when you can also watch us live on YouTube? I'm Lisa Mateo. And I'm Tom Keen. Join us weekday mornings along with Paul Sweeney and Michael Barr starting at 7 a.m. Head to the Bloomberg podcast page on YouTube to hear and see the smartest voices on global markets and investment. Make Bloomberg Surveillance an essential part of your morning routine weekdays from 7 to 10. Visit the Bloomberg podcast page on YouTube and click on the live feed to join us today. Join us in Chicago or virtually on May 2nd for Bloomberg's Business Value of AI event and networking reception. This event will gather business and technology executives to share their experiences and provide insights into their strategies for deploying AI that achieves a desirable ROI. You'll also learn how companies have successfully implemented AI solutions that have improved productivity and profitability. This program is proudly sponsored by IBM. Register at BloombergLive.com slash AI slash radio. Coming up next on Bloomberg Business Week, we check in with Doug Krisner for a preview of what's coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Now, your company news headlines on Bloomberg Radio. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Levi Strauss shares now up by 7.3%. Levi reported higher than expected sales and profit in the first quarter amid market share gains and lowered costs, helping to fuel a more optimistic full year outlook. Disney shareholders today handed CEO Bob Iger a vote of confidence, rejecting dissident investor Nelson Peltz's bid for a board seat at the giant entertainment company. Disney, though, down today by 3 Intel is revealing new details about its manufacturing operations and says losses have deepened at the chipmaker's factory network and the business may not reach a break-even point for several years. Intel is giving a more detailed picture of its finances as part of an ambitious turnaround plan by CEO Pat Gelsinger. More from Bloomberg Technologies Ed Ludlow. They're talking about being operationally profitable at some point between now and 2030, so the sell side is see hope that 
but the turnaround will plan will come. It will come later than everyone thought, but there's still belief that separating out the foundry business from uh, the design, essentially the products business, is the right move. And he's also installed a CFO for that standalone foundry business as well, whose name is Lorenzo Flores. And that's Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow reporting. Ford's American auto sales rose 7% in the first quarter on strong demand for gas electric hybrids, despite a laborious launch of a redesigned F-150 pickup truck. Some of the other stories that we're following at this hour, Lilly's weight loss drug ZepBound is in shortage in the U.S. after mounting complaints by patients, doctors, and pharmacists who are having trouble finding the drug. Turned out to be a mixed day on Wall Street. Coming up, we'll have more on the markets. And those are our top company stories. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio and Television. It's, All right. Bloom it's Bloomberg <laughs> Business Week. That's Carol Master. I'm Tim Stenebeck. Tim was explaining and a story. It was yeah, really complicated. Yeah, talking a little, talking a little story. Going down memory lane. Um, because Doug Krisner is in here. He is. He's and, in the house. Uh, Doug. Yo. Just back from California, still recovering. Well, that was a week ago. Trip. I'm still recovering. <laughs> I'm still trying recovering. to get my head into the news flow. I mean, you know, every it's, day, it's, right? I know, I know. Believe it or not, it's Asia Thursday. Yeah. Uh, which means... That means it's like oh, yeah. Friday's Eve for Doug. To, what do, tomorrow's what's your top Friday. of mind for you? So yeah. Janet Yellen is on her way to China. She yes. was talking to reporters about uh, reserving certain options that the administration may have when you're dealing with this issue of overcapacity. It's showing up in a big way when you look at the EV market in China. Right. This is something we've talked a lot about vis-a-vis -vis the European auto market. Um, and I think there's concern here uh, on the part of the detrimental effect that overcapacity, not in EVs necessarily, but anything that may Sorry. be related to clean energy. Uh, so yeah. it, there's, a, hmm. there's still deflation in China and they have kind of the, maybe the motivation to export a lot of that overcapacity right now. And that could have a very negative impact in other markets like Europe and the United very States. Very interesting, all this kind of protectionism that seems to be going on. Okay, so that's, that's that where way. I wanted to go next. What? We didn't have a chance to talk about this yesterday because it broke late in the day, but China's asking traders to curb some arrival of overseas corn. Did you see this, Doug? I didn't see that. So this is interesting. Chinese customs have asked some traders to limit deliveries of foreign corn into bonded areas in a move aimed at easing huh. domestic oversupply and supporting prices for farmers uh. before planting season. So another example of that protectionism. Right, right, right. Well, but the deflation story is a big story. And, and one of the key questions that we've been asking a lot of our guests, and you and I have talked about this, you guys and I have talked about this in the past. No, you, just you and I, not him. Well, well, I'm just here talking the, about the, corn. The, no, the issue of corn? whether, where, whether China kidding. could repeat what yeah. Japan went through yeah. 30 years ago, that they're stuck. In, next week, we'll get the PMI, or not the PMI, the inflation data for China, and we'll see whether or not these deflationary forces um, are, are even more stubborn than what we've seen in the past. I mean, on the wholesale level, we've China's been stuck in deflation for m more than a year and a half. Although, did you see a story, was it yesterday, that was... Did I bring this up Don't yesterday? bring up the corn one. No, I'm not, I'm not I, I, didn't, I didn't get no, to the corn. I can't remember if I mentioned it, but this whole idea of like everybody has been so gung-ho in India, but now all of a sudden folks are saying, okay, stop the investment, you know, the enthusiasm in India. Maybe it's time right, for right, China that right. maybe things are finally it's starting. There's been a huge wave of money going into yeah. India for obvious reasons. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could make the case that the, the market was very much underinvested relative to China. And then you have got well, the American companies that are seeing that, you know, Apple, let's diversify the supply chain. Let's move out of China a little bit and reduce our risk or the or the but exposure. But they're still there in a there, big way. But there's been so much, I think, you know, it's it's sensible that you might get a little bit of There's an entire chapter in Brad Stone's most recent book about Amazon uh, trying to get into India after not working, in, after it didn't work out in China. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know what I wanted to ask you? Go. What? Four-day four work week, Steve Cohen? Yeah, I, I, we were talking about that on the call. Everybody's talking about Everybody's that. Everybody's talking about but it. But the interesting thing is that he's invested in golf courses as a result of this. I mean, that's getting out in front in right. a big way, right? People, Thinking that you're going to have more time to recreate. But you know, not four, his, What does a four-day work week mean? Maybe more some, golf. Okay, let's go. Or maybe some Friday fun. Mets games. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Not for his workers. No. You, you're running a fund. you got to be there. The market's, the market's That's right. Open. That's right. Maybe and the market's only going to be open four days a week. What world are you living in? I don't think so. I mean, we're dream a long world. Yeah, dream <laughs> world is yeah. right. That we're a long way Fantasy away from that. Island. We're, we're a long way from that. No, but it's kind of interesting. But we have seen. Was it? Is it Bernie Sanders who's talked about the four day? Yeah, work he's talked week? about it. I think. That yeah, it, he did. 
I, don't I know. would imagine that you know what we've experienced as a result of the pandemic, even if it's four days in the office, let's say, yeah. what you're able to do remotely from work, you know, half day or whatever, there's, it's evolving. I don't know that anyone has the answer right now. What you're able to do evolving. from the golf course? But either that too, right? How many deals are done on the golf course? A lot. The golf course, the if, chairlift. If you're a dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, it's another topic. <laughs> uh, you don't see me on the golf course, Carol Nassar. No, but I, probably on the ski slopes. That's true. I'll All right. be there. All right. Have a good show. All right. Thanks. Really appreciate Thank it. I vote for four days. Anybody? Four days? Yeah, everyone's raising their hand. All right, that's going to do it uh, for the Wednesday edition. <laughs> Have a good and safe evening from Tim and me, folks. Balance of Power starts right now. Live from the financial capital of the world, broadcasting across the globe, this is WBBR New York, Bloomberg 1130. From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Biden rebukes Israel, saying he's outraged by the deaths of seven humanitarian aid workers in Gaza, as protest voters show dissatisfaction with the administration's handling of the war in yesterday's primary states. We'll have more on the political potency of the Israel issue as well as the crisis at our southern border and how it's impacting Democratic campaign efforts in a conversation with Congresswoman Susan Delbene, chair of the DCCC. And we'll ask her about the path forward for Ukraine aid, which might not hit the House floor for weeks. Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council will tell us how the delay is impacting the war on the ground. So we have much to discuss this evening, Joe, in terms of geopolitics and the influence it is having on domestic politics from Ukraine aid and challenges that House Speaker Mike Johnson is facing to Israel and challenges that an incumbent president campaigning for re-election is facing in that regard. Yeah, challenges that uh, continue to get more complex, certainly now uh, after the what Israel says is the accidental killing of these seven uh, aid workers with the, the uh, Jose Andres organization. Uh, we heard about this today at the White House, where Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre responded to a reporter's question about some of the comments that Joe Biden had about this. He uh, had said earlier that Israel has not done enough to protect civilians. Here's the message from the White House today. The president's statement was very, very strong, right? Very straightforward. Uh, he wants to uh, he wants to see a, um, a an investigation that's swift, uh, an investigation that's comprehensive, uh, that has uh, that brings accountability, uh, and he wants to make sure that it is made public. Uh, we leave it to uh, obviously uh, the Israeli government to do that investigation. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams to start the conversation on this. Nick, we understand that there's going to be a meeting tomorrow. Joe Biden, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, a, a very critical time for them to speak. What's going to be the message from the White House? Well, I think you're going to see the president reiterate uh, his statement from last night, which was pretty extraordinary. I mean, it was one of those real sit up and take notice moments when the when the president essentially rebukes an ally in such, such strong terms. So, I mean, there are a couple things going on here. One is... Uh, the fact that uh, the president obviously wants to condemn the killing of, of seven people, humanitarian aid workers. Uh, World uh, Central Kitchen says this was a deliberate strike by Israel, though Israel has denied that. Um, obviously, there's a ton of blowback on the president for continuing to offer essentially unallied support for Israel. So what you're seeing is a president who's really trying to balance uh, condemnation against this horrific strike, but also the, the fact that the U.S. is going to keep on supporting Israel. Well, you mentioned that World Central Kitchen is maintaining that this was intentional, despite the Biden administration suggesting that there is no evidence uh, right. to suggest that. Jose Andres, of course, the founder and famed uh, chef, gave an interview to Reuters in which he said, this is not just a bad luck situation where, oops, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place. He went on to say the U.S. must do more to tell Prime Minister Netanyahu this war 
needs to end now. The difficulty is ending the war now may leave Hamas as a threat to Israel. And therein lies the rub for not just the Biden administration, but the Netanyahu government as well. Right. And that's what you're seeing. What I mean, I expect they'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, I mean, it, it, we should make clear, as you said at the top, Israel has vehemently denied that this was an intentional strike. And it would seem to go against uh, all sorts of uh, sort of ideas about what they about what they have in, in terms of how they're prosecuting this war. But, uh, you know, this is just a struggle we continue to see from from the Biden administration. They have said the president has said, listen, there are essentially no red lines with Israel. We are not going to condition military aid. We are going to keep up our support. We are going to make sure they can prosecute this war against Hamas. They have every right to do that. But then you have a succession of actions by Israel that keeps putting more and more pressure on President Biden and forces him to respond. The question I'm really looking for is, okay, what now? I mean, if you have another one of these attacks, you have starvation in Gaza, at what point does the president say things have to change here? We have to exert leverage on Israel in a much more meaningful way. And so far, we just haven't seen that. This is happening as the White House continues to call on the House to act on the supplemental emergency uh, funding request for uh, not just Israel, but also Ukraine. Both of these have become more complex over time. And lawmakers are going to return to this mm. next week. Speaker Johnson has some very difficult decisions to make here, doesn't he? He does. And, you know, he's trying to tie this to a lot of different ideas. And maybe there's a way out of this where he can appeal the, to, to the real conservative base that, that oppo the conservatives in Congress who oppose the idea of Ukraine aid. I mean, it is this extraordinary situation where you have a president who's demanding the aid. Mike Johnson has said basically, yes, I want this aid to go ahead. The House overwhelmingly supports the aid. And, the, and but Mike Johnson needs to appease these conservatives who could oust him as speaker if he if they don't get what what he want, what they want. So, the, but what you're seeing really is President Biden saying, "I'm not going to play these games. We're not going to do any horse trading. I want a straight up or down vote." We're going to have to see whether Mike Johnson is willing to take that on at the risk of his own speakership. That could be sooner than later, from what it, we understand. Indeed. He promised to vote after Easter. Nick, thanks for being with us as always. Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams elsewhere. Both Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump taking wins in a host of primaries last night. But many voters still finding a way to push back against their party leaders. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco, who covers the White House with an eye on the campaign trail for us. Michelle, it's great to see you. The four states uh, last evening included Wisconsin, which is awfully important to both of these uh, potential paths to the White House for the Trump and Biden campaigns. And we saw a pronounced protest votes against both of them. Let's start with Donald Trump. Nikki Haley pulled at least 10 percent in all of the states that we're talking about last night. What does that represent? Yeah, that's right, Joe. And I think, you know, voters would be forgiven for forgetting that yesterday was a multi-primary day. But yeah, indeed, those four states, uh, resounding wins, if you can call them that, for both Biden and Trump. But really, so much of the country is uh, exerting that sentiment that you mentioned. The, you know, we had the North Texas guy last week registering as a presidential candidate under the name literally anybody else. I mean, it just really reflects how people are, are looking at this race with with these two guys again. But uh, specific to your point in, in Wisconsin and other uh, key battleground states. I think what you're seeing that's troublesome for the Biden campaign is there are those protest votes, uh, whether it be for blank ballots in the case of New York or uh, as undecided in, in some other primaries, uh, largely representing uh, what you we were just talking about with Nick, uh, you know, dissatisfaction over the Biden's uh, Biden administration's stance on Israel, uh, Gaza. Uh, that is a huge thorn in the side of many Democrats right now. Uh, also, you know, you can you can imagine there is some dissatisfaction around economic issues that could cause some trouble at the ballot box in November for the, the Biden side. But of course, not so much popularity, uh, you know, for Trump, who's already battling in the courts, uh, legal courts, but also in the court of public opinion, uh, you know, with Nikki Haley long been out of the race. And as you say, uh, showing a formidable challenge uh, in that regard in double digits in, in all four primary states. Well, Michelle, I'm glad you raised the economic issues as well that may be weighing on the minds of voters, specifically inflation and the level of interest rates as a result of the inflation that we have seen. This is something that the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, talked about earlier today at an event in California. Take a listen. These recent data do not, however, materially change the overall picture, which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, <clears throat> and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path.
Michelle, what was really interesting about not just Powell's remarks, but the Q&A that happened afterward is he was talking about how it wasn't just demand that was driving inflation. That is something we hear often in Washington, especially from Republicans, this idea that it was all that fiscal stimulus, trillions of dollars getting poured into the economy. And that is why we were dealing with the inflation that we were. Powell kept coming back, though, to supply side issues. And I wonder if that just kind of speaks to the messaging disconnect between what people are feeling and, and what the reality is and how the Biden campaign is trying to bring those two things together. Well, you know, I don't envy Chair Powell's uh, role as Fed chair in an election year where, you know, everyone is going to try to throw the political question at him. But he did give that sort of dry economic response and trying to clarify, you know, the 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 broad apolitical analysis on, on what's going on in the economy. But I think, you know, mainly what the comfort was out of uh, Powell's speech and remarks today at that event were that there no news is good news. Um, he, he largely said the, the Fed is going to stay the course for now. Uh, they, they are, of course, watching those inflation readings, especially the, the past two that showed a little bit uh, hotter inflation than expected. Um, but, the, you know, the, for now, it's, it's still uh, stay the course at some point this year is the phrasing in terms of having an interest rate cut, um, but nothing to be uh, too too excited about today. And of course, the later the cut comes, the closer we will get to the presidential election. Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco, thank you very much as always for joining us. Now coming up, abortion and women's rights in the spotlight on the heels of a key court decision in Florida. Democratic House leader Hakeem Jeffries putting the issue front and center as the campaign season heats up. It's so important. Friday, we zero in on March jobs. Headline unemployment rate of 3.9%. With fully employed America. Will the numbers affect how the Fed views the labor market? What's the why for 200 whatever thousand per month? Continued resilience in the job market. The March jobs report on Bloomberg surveillance. Job growth blew past expectations. Markets on the move here. Friday morning at 8.30. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. And always on Bloomberg 1130. Context changes everything. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 511 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. Gold now at $2,300. Gold today up nine tenths of 1%. Gold at another record, extending a week's long rally after Fed Chair Jay Powell reiterated that it will be likely appropriate to start lowering interest rates at some point this year. And with more on Powell's remarks today, here's Bloomberg's Vinnie Del Judice. Powell says caution remains the watchword at the U.S. Central Bank. We do not expect that it will be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2%. Given the strength of the economy and progress on inflation so far, we have time to let the incoming data guide our decisions on policy. The Fed chair spoke at California, Stanford University. Futures trading implies the odds of a rate cut by June are roughly even. Vinnie Dell, Judice Bloomberg Radio. Powell's comments were carried live on Bloomberg Radio. Dow Industrials today down 43, a drop of one-tenth of one percent. S&P up five, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. NASDAQ up by two-tenths of one percent. Ten-year, 4.34 percent. The two-year, 4.67 percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Gentlemen, we have arrived in Philadelphia. Local time is 3.05 p.m. and the temperature is 67 degrees. At this time, you are now free to use your cellular devices. You know that feeling when you get to turn your phone on after the plane lands? You can have that feeling every time you drive. Make sure your cell phone is stowed away whenever you are behind the wheel. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. Okay, men, time to be an all-star caregiver. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments. Be there emotionally and physically. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Trump brags about he's the reason Roe v. Wade was overturned. Here's his quote. I did something no one thought possible. I got rid of Roe v. Wade, end of quote. 
And now he and his MAGA officials are calling on a nat for a national ban on the right to choose in every state. I promise you, with the Democratic Congress, Kamala and I will make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. I promise you. Democrats focusing on reproductive rights, as President Biden refers to there, is a key issue to help take control of the House in November. Yesterday's field hearing in Florida is one example of this. Another, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee's efforts at putting IVF-related ads up in vulnerable Republican districts around the country. The DCCC is tasked with getting Democrats elected to the House, so we're joined by the chair right now, Congresswoman Susan Del Bene of Washington. Congresswoman, it's good to see you. Welcome back to Bloomberg. The president says it all there. If you're going to take the House for him to restore Roe v. Wade, is abortion the issue that you will use to get there? Well, I think it's been abortion and reproductive freedom have been on the ballot every day since the Dobbs decision. Over and over and over again, we've seen special elections where people have stood up to fight to protect reproductive freedom, whether it's in Ohio or Kentucky or Wisconsin or Virginia, um, or even more recently, you saw a big Democratic win in a state, a state legislative race in Alabama. Um, folks know that Republicans are pushing for a nationwide abortion ban. They are very clear about it. Um, more and more information comes forward about their efforts, whether it's in Florida most recently or the Supreme Court decision in Alabama. They're trying to take away reproductive rights and the people aren't going to stand for it. And we've seen huge turnout in elections over and over and over again, standing up for reproductive freedom. And I expect that is going to continue. Well, in Florida specifically, after that decision from the court, there were murmurs here in Washington about whether or not that actually might put Florida back in play as a swing state rather than a firmly red one. Do you see opportunities there for Democrats now that weren't there a few days ago? Or is that overly optimistic about the likelihood of change that swift in today's political climate? Well, I think it's really clear that Republicans are out of step with where the American people are. The American people want to stand up um, for rights and freedoms and for our democracy. And when it comes to reproductive rights and reproductive freedom, um, Republicans are on the wrong side. They continue to try to undermine reproductive freedom, whether it's access to in vitro fertilization, whether it's um, abortion rights and health care. And so we're going to see people turn out, and I expect we're going to see a lot of people turn out in Florida as well. A lot of the message that we've been hearing from Democrats uh, like yourself running for re-election or running for election against this uh, ever-shrinking Republican majority in the House is dysfunction. Congresswoman, when lawmakers return, including yourself, next week and the matters of Ukraine and Israel are brought up, what role will Democrats play in helping to get these passed or do you not see it happening under this speaker? Well, um, it's been dysfunction, it's been chaos, and it's been extremism uh, from the Republican side from day one of this Congress, whether it's the 15 rounds of votes before they were able to elect Speaker McCarthy then to where we are today. Um, they have, we've been on the brink of shutdowns. We finally got government funding through um, halfway through the fiscal year. Uh, they're incapable of governing and there is no leadership. And when it comes to moving other important legislation, like making sure that we are able to support Ukraine, uh, Speaker Johnson has been incapable of making the decision on how to move forward. But there's really one decision. There's a bipartisan bill that went through the Senate um, that he can put on the House floor right away and it would pass. And so the only reason there hasn't been progress here is because Speaker Johnson refuses to put legislation on the floor. Um, you know, it's this is about leadership and having folks make sure they're doing the right thing to continue to address the issues facing our country. Um, there's just no leadership on the Republican side. Um, folks are too scared to move forward on anything. Let's Let's let folks vote. And frankly, the only way things are going to move forward is if there's bipartisan support. So um, this is another case where it's important that we have bipartisan support and we move bipartisan legislation. 
Well, Congresswoman, as you speak of what you perceive to be weakness in leadership on the Republican side, what about weakness in leadership at the utmost rungs of the leader ladder in democratic politics. President Biden, by all accounts, based on the data and polling that we are seeing, is an incredibly unpopular incumbent president. And most polls show that he is losing to Trump, not just nationally, but in the swing states that ultimately could decide the outcome of this election. How worried are you about the impact that President Biden may have down the ballot in terms of voter enthusiasm and turnout? You know, I've been all across the country to swing districts all across the country. And, um, you know, you talk to folks and the, these are purple districts. These are places where you have independents, um, probably folks who are former Republicans who don't know what happened to their party and others who want to see folks who are going to go to Washington, D.C. to govern, who are going to find solutions to the issues facing our country and help move us forward. And they want folks who are going to stand up for our rights, our freedoms, and our democracy. And when I've talked to voters across the country, um, they are looking for those strong leaders, and we have them. Um, our incumbents and our candidates who are running against Republicans in swing districts across the country really are authentic leaders who are addressing issues, talking to the their communities about the challenges they face and putting forward real solutions. And that's what this is about. That's why we've seen success um, even more recently in New York 3, where um, on, Long, on the Long Island seat, where we had a great Democratic candidate, now um, a congressman again, who spoke to issues facing the community, um, a Republican candidate who was afraid to talk to yeah. people, talk about where she stood. That made the difference. Yeah, Tom Swazi talked a lot about the border. Congresswoman Susan Del Bene, Democrat from Washington and chair of the DCCC, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And coming up, we'll have more on the politics of the border, specifically with our Texas Bureau Chief, Julie Fine. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Now, your three day weather forecast on Bloomberg 1130. Occasional rain for tonight around the city. Breezy as well, low temperature, low 40s, and mostly cloudy skies on Thursday. Just some scattered showers left over in 45 to 50. Any showers quit tomorrow night. Low temperature back in the mid to upper 30s. Maybe a brief shower on Friday with clouds and some sun. Breezy in 50. Periods of cloud and sun breezy and in the 50s here for Saturday, the start of the weekend. This is Gary Best with your three-day forecast on Bloomberg 1130. From the Bloomberg Newsroom, I'm Amy Morris with the latest headlines. Tensions are even deeper between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And now the two leaders are scheduled to speak by phone tomorrow. President Biden issued his most forceful criticism yet of Israel's military conduct after that airstrike on a convoy of workers from World Central Kitchen, a disaster relief group founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying he was outraged and heartbroken and calling for swift investigations, also accusing Israel of not doing enough to protect civilians. Biden and Netanyahu have not spoken since March 18th. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre says the U.S. continues to urge Israel to complete a full investigation on the strike, but she would not give specifics. We want to make sure that the findings are public uh, and that uh, there is accountability. I want to be very careful here. I'm not going to get ahead of that process. There is a process underway. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Also, the fate of a controversial Texas immigration law is now in the hands of a federal appeals court in New Orleans. Lawyers for the government and interested parties opposing the law say Texas does not have the authority to craft nor enforce immigration law. Global news 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg. Immigration and the border are front and center on the campaign trail. A Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll finding that issue is second only to the economy as top of mind for voters. And it's the subject of this week's Big Take story where we take a closer look at what's happening specifically on the Texas border. 
For years, federal officials, lawmakers, and residents along the 2,000-mile border with Mexico have grappled with how to handle people who illegally cross into the U.S. As Border Patrol encounters hit records, it's arguably exposed the U.S. immigration system as an underfunded, opaque, and obsolete relic that's bursting at the seams. In April 2022, Governor Abbott decided federal authorities weren't doing enough about increased border crossings. He directed the Texas Division of Emergency Management to charter buses to take people who entered the U.S. illegally to northern cities, or as he called them, sanctuary cities. With each bus, Abbott has made this an issue that has just burst onto the 2024 scene. It was impossible for Eric Adams to ignore in New York. The Democrats were compelled to do something. That, in turn, made it a critical problem for one person above all, President Joe Biden. Biden agreed to a bill that included a lot of stuff that Democrats very recently would never have agreed to, but it just collapsed. Donald Trump made it clear he opposed it. House Republicans followed Trump. One of the takeaways I think that's lost here is that this might have been the only shot. Joining us now for more on this story is our Texas Bureau Chief, Julie Fine, who was part of this reporting trip to the U.S. border. So, Julie, just tell us more about what exactly you witnessed and what you heard, not just from border officials, uh, border patrol officials and Texas state officials there, but actual migrants who have just made this journey and are doing the crossing themselves. Well, you know, you've heard a lot about Eagle Pass. It's certainly been in the news because of so many border crossings. What's very interesting, first of all, about migrants coming over is there is an increased presence now and there is border wire. So what you're seeing are fewer people coming through Eagle Pass. But that wire, I have to tell you, for people that have traveled four months, two months, they're going to figure out a way to get there. And that's basically what we heard from migrants that we spoke to. I mean, a lot of the migrants told us they're, they're just hoping for a better life. They're looking for a better life. Some were fearing for their lives. So that's why they decided to make this trip here. We heard uh, from Donald Trump over the weekend in Grand Rapids where he referred to migrants as prisoners, murderers, drug dealers, mental patients and terrorists who he said the countries are sending the worst they have. Can you help us understand who is crossing the border here, Julie Fine? Because we understand from immigration officials that there are many cases, poor families escaping poverty. There are many cases where there are poor families escaping poverty. There are many cases where people come because of fear of the cartels. Now, are there drug traffickers? Are you, know, are you hearing about drugs coming over the border? Yes, but there are also people that just really want to come to America and join their families here. So it is interesting because when you are on the border, you see several things. You see how porous it is. Like, when you move this many people into Eagle Pass, migrants are going to find other areas to cross the border. But everybody, even those helping migrants, will say, clearly, this system is not working right now. I think that's the one thing there's a lot of agreement on. Well, I want to point everyone to the big take on the terminal and online at Bloomberg.com. Bloomberg's Julie Fine helping to lead our coverage. Julie, thank you. This is Bloomberg. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 527 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long here at Bloomberg. The Dow lower today, the S&P, NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100 index all higher. S&P today up five, a gain of one-tenth of one percent. Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell is signaling policymakers will wait for clearer signs of lower inflation before cutting interest rates, even though a recent bump in prices did not alter their broader trajectory. Powell's remarks at Stanford's business, government and Society Forum for broadcast live here on Bloomberg Radio. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected. The economy added in an, av an average of 265,000 jobs per month uh, in the three years through February, a faster pace than we have seen since last June. And the higher inflation data over January and February were above the low readings in the second half of last year. 
Disney shareholders handed CEO Bob Iger a vote of confidence today, rejecting dissident investor Nelson Peltz's bid for a board seat of the giant entertainment company. Disney shares today lower by 3.1%. Again, a mixed day on Wall Street. Dow Industrials fell 43 points, down by just about one-tenth of 1%. S&P up one-tenth, NASDAQ higher by two-tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Slash. From the state courts. Tell us a little about facts of the case. To the Supreme Court. Can Congress force a judicial code on the justices? June Grosso delivers your legal intelligence. Multiple lawsuits were filed against the emergency rule. The Bloomberg Law Podcast. Is the toughest hurdle for prosecutors proving Trump's intent? Listen live weeknights at 6 on Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Or anywhere you get your podcasts. Untext changes everything. The balance of power continues now with Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lines.